My story is about encryption and censorship, and I will get to all that, but I want to start by giving you my take-home message. Now, I'll admit to some bias here, because I'm a computer science professor and I happen to love math. But that bias aside, there are lots of very good reasons to encourage your daughters and your sons and even yourselves to study math and computer science. The most obvious of these is you can go to work for any number of high-profile tech companies and make huge sacks of cash. <laughs> Now, okay, this is a TED event, so maybe piles and piles of money seems like a bit of a petty motivation. So let me try again with something that's of deep personal importance to all of us. Facebook. <laughs> Everyone uses Facebook. My mom is in the audience. My guess is right now she's updating her status to say how proud she is of me. <laughs> But I want you to think about this. Imagine that you try to go to Facebook, and rather than seeing the Facebook page, you see this, that uh, the web page is not available. Facebook took too long to respond, and so the connection timed out. Now, if you're anything like me, your response is something like, come on, stupid internet, let's go, and you hit the refresh button a whole bunch of times. But in this imagined scenario, every time you hit the refresh button, you get the same exact error. And in fact, if you hit the refresh button too many times, you may find yourself unable to use anything on the internet at all. Well, so you give up on Facebook, and you decide to go do some online shopping, looking for cute summer skirts, <laughs> only to find that that query, that search, has been banned. Likewise, if you had looked for cute skirts, or summer skirts, or just skirts. In fact, I want you to think about all the websites that you use on a regular basis, Facebook, Google, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Skype, all that stuff. Imagine all those things suddenly not being available to you at all. Sadly, in many parts of the world, they don't have to imagine this scenario. This is their reality. So based on data that was collected by Reporters Without Borders and the Open Net Initiative, this is the current estimate of the state of internet censorship around the world. Now, to avoid visual clutter, I've left the color legend off of the map, but I want to draw your attention to the red countries. These are places where internet censorship is so heavy-handed, censorship of what can be said, what can be read, what kinds of software you can download, it's so heavy-handed that they're simply referred to as internet black holes, or enemies of the internet. Well, so how is it that websites or search queries are able to be blocked in the first place? To answer this question, I need to give you a, a very brief and a very high-level overview of how things work on the internet. So let's say that I open a web browser and I type in the search terms, free speech democracy. Now, from our perspective, when I hit return, my web browser is just very quickly populated with the search results. But in fact, there are a bunch of messages that are passed back and forth under the hood between the laptop and the search server. In computer speak, these messages are called packets. Every packet starts with routing information. This is basically like the envelope on a letter. It tells you where the packet's coming from and where it's going to. These from and to addresses are special numeric sequences that are called IP addresses. Maybe you've heard of this term before. It's IP addresses that computers understand. The human rememberable addresses like facebook.com and google.com, these correspond to one or more of these numeric sequences under the hood. Okay, so let's say you live in a country where they want to block access to Google. This is very easy to do because every single packet tells you exactly where it's going. Uh, and if there's Anything that computers are very good at, it's pattern matching. They can do it extremely quickly. For example, to look at the to IP address of each packet and compare it to a list of IP addresses that are forbidden. So this address-based packet filtering is very easy for sensors to do. It's also conceptually very easy to get around. In particular, if you know that messages that are addressed to go directly to Google are going to be blocked, just don't send them directly to Google. Instead, you can send them to a friendly machine that's on the other side of the sensor's monitoring point and whose IP address hasn't been blocked. This machine is called a proxy. It acts as a proxy for you. It takes your message and then forwards it on to its ultimate recipient. When it gets the response, it sends that back to you. Notice that in this way, at no point is Google's IP address ever seen by the sensor. Instead, it's the proxy's address. Now, normally people don't use a single proxy, they use a proxy service like Tor. Maybe you've heard of Tor as a result of the Snowden leaks. 
Tor offers many, many potential proxies to connect to, and this provides a defense in depth in case the sensor gets wise and manages to block a few of the proxy's IP addresses. Tor also offers this nice functionality that when packets arrive at the Tor network, they get bounced around randomly inside of the network before they exit. This makes it very difficult to correlate messages coming in with messages going out. So having uh, proxy services like Tor available really reduces the problem of avoiding sensors to just being able to sneak by the sensor to get from your laptop to the proxy. And here's where things become really interesting and really hard. I told you that when I type free speech democracy into my web browser and I hit return, that there's a bunch of messages that are passed back and forth. And here I'm using a free and fairly simple tool called Wireshark to capture that entire conversation. In the lime green section up above, you'll see all the messages that are being passed back and forth. I don't expect you to be able to read that. In fact, if you could, I'd be pretty impressed. So I've highlighted just one particular packet in this discussion because I want you to see that some funny white space aside, my search terms are right there for the sensor to see. Even if the IP address I'm sending to isn't blocked, if the sensor's willing to dig through the traffic, it'll see my search terms. Well, so this is one small conversation involving one laptop. But in fact, current state-of-the-art censorship equipment, which, by the way, is mostly built in the US and then sold to places like Iran and Pakistan and China, this current state-of-the-art equipment does what we call deep packet inspection of the kind I just described uh, at extremely high rates. In fact, we think that China performs this on every single packet that crosses its internet border. This is a lot of packets, by the way, many billions of them per minute. Deep packet inspection is a very powerful tool in the hands of sensors because it allows them to enforce very precise policies. For example, rather than blocking an entire website, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to block uh, HTTP messages or web browser messages, but everything else can go through. Or maybe I'll allow certain HTTP messages, but none that contain specific forbidden keywords. So how are we going to combat this new level of sophistication? I mean, it's clear we need some way to hide the contents, to hide these, hidden, these forbidden keywords. If you, if you have watched you know, Homeland or 24 or seen any modern spy or hacker movie, you know that when you want to hide data, you use something called encryption. So what is encryption anyway? Eh, you can think of it as a box. Sometimes it's literally a box that you connect wires to, but more often it's a piece of software. And this box does a bunch of fancy math to turn your private data into a random-looking sequence of characters. It isn't really random, though, because if you know a specific special piece of information called the secret key, and it's called a secret key because it's meant to be secret, if you know this, then you can take this sequence of random characters and very quickly recover from it the private data that you started with. The promise of good encryption is that if you don't know the secret key, it will take you a prohibitively long time and require an exorbitant amount of computational power to take this random sequence and recover anything useful about the data from it. So maybe you see where this is going. If your laptop and the proxy share a secret key and the sensor doesn't know it, then you can just encrypt your packet before you send it to the proxy. The proxy has the key, so it can undo the encryption, get back the original request, and just do its proxying thing. The sensor, on the other hand, doesn't have the key, and as a result, just sees this random-looking sequence of characters. So we have proxies to help us get around address-based filtering, and we have encryption to hide the message as it goes from your laptop to the proxy. So why isn't this game over for the sensors? It isn't because while it's true that encryption hides all of these you know, forbidden keywords and such, everything about the message, the fact that encryption is being used is obvious, even to computer tests that have to be run at very high speeds. Now, sensors hate encryption precisely because it prevents them from being able to see what's going on. And so we've had uh, numerous very high-profile instances of countries for periods of time simply blocking every packet that uses encryption. For us, this would mean that our packet never makes it from the laptop to the proxy, and we're essentially back to square one. The problem here is that encrypted data doesn't look like, well, it doesn't look like unencrypted data. It lacks the structure that you would expect to see in normal traffic that goes on the web. 
And normally this is exactly what you'd want. You'd want encryption to completely randomize your data so that it's hidden. But in this particular setting, the randomness is a liability. So let me go back to talking about encryption and what it does for a moment. I said there's a bunch of fancy math. What this fancy math does effectively is provide a, a, an extremely uh, compact way to encode an enormous list of potential random-looking output strings to output. I do mean enormous here, too, like the number of grains of sand on a very large beach, that kind of enormous. The secret key selects which one of these strings is to be used from this list. All right. Well, some colleagues and I wondered, you know, what if we went a different way with this? What if instead of having the math encode an enormous list of random-looking strings, what if it could encode something that was a bit more useful for this setting? What if the math could encode an enormous list of valid-looking web messages that were searching for things that weren't banned, like sneezing pandas or we hate capitalism? <laughs> Obviously, I'm making these up, but you get my point, because now if we use this to encrypt packets as they go from the laptop to the proxy, it doesn't look like any encryption's actually been done. It has. The original search was for free speech democracy. The data that was there is protected exactly as it would have been before with the random-looking encryption. It just doesn't look random anymore. Well, so you don't have to only use this list of, you know, sneezing panda and fluffy kitties, this list of, of, of uh, web messages to encrypt packets. You can encrypt normal strings, too. You know, for example, here I'm encrypting an email to my mom where I say, Dear Mom, today we will protest, and what comes out is a web search for fluffy kitties. In fact, if you do the math right, you don't just need to have a list of web messages. You can have, Dear Mom, today we will protest, be encrypted and look like street addresses or credit card numbers. You can imagine now that you could populate an Excel spreadsheet with a whole bunch of encrypted messages that look like nothing more than street addresses and credit card numbers. Let me get back to the problem at hand. So, uh, my graduate student, Kevin Dyer, who's in the audience someplace and is actually about to become Dr. Dyer, found a web, a, a cloud provider inside of China that would take payment from an American credit card, which, by the way, was no small feat. He then installed on a server inside of China a web browser that was empowered with our new encryption technology. And we decided to run a field test. So to begin, we didn't turn the encryption on. We just did things that we knew would get us blocked. So, for example, we tried to go to Facebook, we tried to go to YouTube, we tried to go to the Tor website, and all those things were indeed blocked as we expected. So we, we knew we were actually were sitting behind the great Chinese firewall. Then we turned on encryption. And every five minutes for a month, we did things that we knew would be blocked without our encryption technology. We never were blocked, and we never saw any signs of being detected. So we were pretty excited about this. I mean, this is really promising. And in fact, uh, well, after a month, we shut the test down because we ran out of money. But this is, in fact, now starting to be rolled out for use in censorship circumvention. But I don't want to give you the impression that we won the battle somehow. We haven't. I've swept a lot of details under the rug here, and there are still some very, very hard problems to solve. Let me give you some examples. I said that this whole encryption thing, even the traditional randomized-looking encryption, all this is possible if the laptop and the proxy share a secret key that the sensor doesn't know. How did these two parties come to know this secret in the first place? It's not like they just know each other. In fact, this kind of thing happens all the time. When you make a connection to your bank, for example, there's a special uh, sequence of messages that are exchanged, at the end of which uh, the bank and your laptop share a key, and we believe that nobody in the middle knows what that key is. This exchange is actually called a key exchange. And that's great, but it doesn't help us here. And the reason it doesn't help us is because it's obvious that that sequence of messages is a key exchange. And the only reason to do a key exchange is if you're going to do encryption. So if you're trying to hide the fact that you're doing encryption, you don't want to blow your cover by saying, hey, we're going to do encryption. <laughs> so we need a, a, a key exchange that's also hidden in the same way that our encryption is. Here's another problem. Let's say that at 10 o'clock, I make a connection to the proxy. And the sensor's watching and says, yeah, there's something suspicious about this. So 15 minutes later, the sensor makes a connection to this potential proxy. It says, hey, are, are you a proxy service? And when they say yes, well, now that proxy service is going to be blocked. 
This kind of active attack we thought was impossible, uh, not in nation state stales anyway, where they have so much traffic to look at. But indeed, we are starting to see exactly these kinds of things coming out of China, and we don't have a way around it. So in addition to the piles and piles of cash that can be made, I hope that I've given you new motivation to encourage your daughters and your sons to study math and computer science, because if I'm honest, we really need the help. Thank you. <laughs>